Hello and welcome to the fourth webinar in this series presented by Optimized Thermal Systems. The topic of this webinar is optimization, cost, and health benefits of copper tube plate pin heat exchangers. We're going to go with a slightly different format on this one. It seems like everyone has a bit of webinar fatigue for obvious reasons. So we're actually just going to post this video on our YouTube channel. And then in a few weeks, we'll have a live premiere with a Q&A session at the end. So if you're watching this before the Q&A session, please feel free to submit any questions to myself or Yoram, who will be co-presenting with me. And we'll do our best to answer those questions during the live Q&A. Uh, you'll be able to find our contact information uh, listed uh, in the next slide and then again at the end. All right, let's get started. The material today has been prepared by myself, Darren Key, of Optimized Thermal Systems and by Yoram Shabti of Heat Transfer Technologies. This has been done in conjunction with the Copper Development Association. And uh, here's our contact information listed here. Um, so please feel free to reach out with any questions you might have about the material presented here today or about the upcoming webinars or you know, any other topics you might be interested in hearing about. Here's the contents of the presentation. Uh, I'll do a brief introduction of the webinar series itself, and then we'll discuss the benefits of copper, focusing on uh, health benefits, specifically taking a look at the inherent antimicrobial properties of copper. Then we'll take a look at the evolution of copper tube fin heat exchangers and the gradual transition to smaller diameter tubes and the benefits of doing that. Then I'll discuss some recent success stories of three and five millimeter tube fin heat exchangers. Then I'll hand it over to Yoram to discuss the cost model. And uh, he'll be taking a look at some of the same case studies that I'll be presenting. Introduction. As I mentioned previously, this is actually the fourth webinar in the series. The previous three are listed here and can be found on the OTS website. Some of the fundamentals and evolution content that I'm presenting here today can be found in much greater detail in that webinar one, um, which is a great resource for understanding the fundamental thermodynamics as well as the benefits of transitioning to a smaller diameter tube in a heat exchanger design. Webinar two discusses the construction methods and uh, some of the equipment that's used in manufacturing tube fin heat exchangers. And then the third webinar discusses Coil Designer, which is a heat exchanger design software produced by OTS. Later this year, we'll also have two more uh, webinars that we'll, uh, we'll be releasing. Um, number five, we'll discuss heat exchanger design for al alternative refrigerants. And uh, number six, we'll discuss the impacts of frost on heat exchanger design. So if you've made it this far, you know, presumably you know what a tube fin heat exchanger is, but just to make sure and to have it on record here, over here on the left, uh, we have the heat exchanger um, tubes uh, through which a working fluid or commonly known as a refrigerant will flow. These tubes are connected to one another with U-bends, these guys over here. And the heat transfer surface area is extended uh, with the use of fins. So shown here is a fairly typical type of assembly um, with a copper tube and aluminum fin assembly. Um, although there's many other materials that are common in industry. And then uh, down here, there's an example of a tube fin heat exchanger that has copper tubes and copper fins. And we'll take a take another look at that particular example later on uh, in the presentation as we get into the antimicrobial benefits of copper. So what's our motivation? What drives heat exchanger design? Why do we need to move to smaller diameter tubes? Well, from a very high level, uh, we typically want energy efficiency to go up. We want to improve environmental and safety concerns. And then of course, as always, we want cost to go down. 
And everything that I'll be presenting here keeps those three parameters uh, in mind. Now let's talk a bit more specifically about the benefits of copper. All right, copper tubes. Um, why do we use copper tubes in heat exchangers? Why are copper tubes beneficial? Well, the heat exchanger's primary job is to transfer heat. So we want to pick a material that has relatively high thermal conductivity. Copper is a relatively common material that has high thermal conductivity when compared with other relatively common materials, such as aluminum or stainless steel. And their thermal conductivities are all listed here. Low thermal conductivity gives us a low wall thermal resistance and improves heat transfer between the working fluid inside the tube and um, the air on the outside of the tube. Copper also has natural antimicrobial properties that help it resist corrosion and biofouling. We'll get into a few reasons why this is important a bit later on. Copper is also compatible with all common refrigerants except for ammonia. And that includes uh, new refrigerants that are coming online now and in the near future. Copper is also uh, soft and pliable, uh, which allows for the easy application of inner grooving or enhancements of the tube, which can help to improve the heat transfer performance of the tube. As we start moving into smaller diameter tubes, there are several benefits, primarily Smaller diameter tubes have thinner walls and less internal volume. A thinner wall means that there's lower thermal resistance between the inner and outer working fluids, and less internal volume means there's less refrigerant charge. So um, a small diameter tube can also withstand uh, much higher pressures uh, due to lower hoop stresses. So as we start to consider um, refrigerants such as a high pressure CO2 as the working fluid, moving to a smaller diameter tube can be quite useful. In fact, there are some copper alloys which can withstand up to 120 bar, which is, uh, you know, it's an important tool to keep in mind and to have in your design toolbox um, when designing a high pressure system. Another benefit of moving to a smaller tube is reduced material cost. So, you know, as the outer diameter and the wall thickness both get smaller, you just end up with less overall material in your tubes. And you'll see that come into play in Yoram's cost model. For copper fins, uh, many of the same benefits apply. Uh, primarily, there's improved thermal conductivity when compared with aluminum or steel uh, and a reduction in biofouling. The value proposition of using copper fins depends, of course, on the particular application and installation, but there are situations in which copper fins are worth consideration. Now let's get into the antimicrobial properties of copper and their benefits. Copper has inherent antimicrobial properties, which have been shown to suppress the growth of certain types of bacteria and mold. I have a couple images over here on the right that show the germination or lack thereof uh, of various fungi on copper and aluminum samples. You can see uh, for these three different types of fungi um, that there's positive germination uh, on the aluminum samples and no germination on the copper. So, the positive germination are these you know, red and orange streaks across the aluminum sample. And then these dots here show that there was uh, no germination on the copper samples. The EPA has actually granted a treated article exemption for copper alloys, which uh, are at least 96.2% copper. One result, uh, of the ongoing coronavirus pandemic is the importance of indoor air quality in the mind of the general public. Of course, this is always forefront in the mind of a good HVAC designer, but um, the general public is perhaps finally starting to catch on to the importance of indoor air quality. Copper has been shown to suppress bacteria and mold growth 
present on its surface, uh, and that includes the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is responsible for the COVID-19 coronavirus. I want to be clear that I'm definitely not making any claims that copper heat exchangers will protect you from COVID-19. That type of statement is far beyond my area of expertise, but the fact is that copper does indeed suppress harmful biogrowth. This treated article exemption actually applies to a wide range of HVAC equipment, such as ductwork, heat exchangers, which is our topic today, as well as drip pans. And you can look up that EPA registration number listed here uh, for more details. Now let's take a look at a couple of studies uh, using copper heat exchangers to improve indoor air quality. First study was done at the Fort Jackson, South Carolina Army Barracks. In this study, heat exchangers were replaced uh, in two nearly identical barracks, one with a copper unit and the other with an aluminum unit. Uh, air samples were taken of outdoor air, vent air, and room air. Um, and these samples were taken throughout the course of the study during both heating and cooling seasons. Uh, CFU per meter cubed, which is a, CFU stands for colony forming unit, which is a unit of measure used in microbiology. Um, it was measured for, uh, for each. As expected, the CFU was higher during the cooling season and um, during cooling season when the uh, evaporator has uh, condensation on it, there's predictably more biogrowth. Uh, during the heating season and the cooling season, the barracks uh, with the aluminum heat exchanger had a statistically significant higher CFU than the barracks with the copper heat exchanger. The next study was done at a New England middle school in which heat exchangers in three separate air handling units were monitored for any biogrowth. The baseline biogrowth mitigation strategy for the system was to use a combination of regular heat exchanger coil cleaning and ultraviolet germicidal irradiation, which is just UV light. Uh, in the first air handling unit, there were no changes made. So that means that uh, the UV lights were left uh, in uh, normal operation and the existing heat exchanger was used, which uh, had uh, copper tubes and aluminum fins. The second air handling unit had no UV lights, or at least the UV lights were turned off, and had a uh, heat exchanger which had copper tubes, copper fins, and a uh, copper frame. And that's, uh, that's what you see here. In the third air handling unit, the UV lights were turned off, and the existing copper tube and aluminum fin coil was used. The results of the study showed that Biogrowth on the heat exchanger was successfully controlled by copper tube and copper coils, even without the use of UVGI equipment. So the conclusions from these two studies is that copper does successfully suppress the fouling of coils, even without the use of UVGI. Copper heat exchangers can significantly reduce airborne fungal concentrations in a room when compared with aluminum assemblies. And there's a whole host of benefits resulting from biofouling, such as reduced energy consumption, uh, which might happen when the heat exchangers foul up. There's also reduced energy consumption from the total elimination of the UV lights. There's also reduced maintenance cost for the cleaning of the coils. And there's actually a total elimination of the maintenance cost for the UVGI equipment because that equipment can be eliminated entirely. Now we'll move on to a brief discussion of the evolution of copper tube fin heat exchangers. Here's our first order analysis of transitioning to smaller diameter tube fin heat exchangers. There's a lot going on here and for a more in-depth discussion, I recommend again that you go back to webinar one, but for the purpose of this webinar in general, we wanna be looking at this dashed line here um, which is for uh, finned round tubes. So 
On the x-axis, we have tube diameter in millimeters. And on the y-axis, we have air side surface density, um, which is the air side heat transfer surface area divided by the total envelope of the heat exchanger. Each square here on these both of these curves um, represent the internal volume of the tube. And over time, we're going from right to left, which is to say that we're moving progressively towards using smaller and smaller diameter tubes. Current state of the art uh, in industry is here in green, so sort of this five to 10 millimeter range here. Uh, manufacturing capability is uh, readily available in this uh, two to five millimeter range. And then uh, future heat exchanger designs are sort of in this less than two millimeter design range. So uh, looking back at the internal volume, let's discuss the internal volume a bit more. Um, if we use, let's say, a, a seven millimeter tube as our baseline, and we compare that to a five millimeter tube, there's actually a 56% reduction in internal volume. And then if we go even smaller down to a three millimeter OD tube, uh, there's actually an 89% reduction in internal volume when compared to that seven millimeter baseline. Reason I wanna draw your attention to this is because um, this is of particular importance as the standard of evaluation for uh, HVAC equipment moves towards overall global warming impact of a unit rather than just looking at energy consumption. Um, for example, if you're using a refrigerant such as R410A, uh, which has a global warming impact of over 2000, um, any reduction in internal volume and thus reduction in charge can have a significant impact on the total global warming potential of that particular system. So very brief recap of moving to smaller tubes. With smaller diameter tubes, you end up with more compact surfaces. So you end up with more heat transfer surface area per volume uh, or per envelope of that heat exchanger. There's less overall material used for that heat exchanger, which feeds nicely into the cost model, which you'll see uh, in a bit in Yorm's portion. There's also smaller internal volume resor resulting in less refrigerant charge, as we just discussed. There's improved hoop stresses, which allows for higher operating pressures. And uh, the one thing, uh, the no free lunch portion of it um, is to keep in mind is that as hydraulic diameter goes down, heat transfer coefficient goes up, which is a good thing, that's what we want, but friction factor also goes up. So that friction factor is the no free lunch portion of it, and it's something to keep in mind uh, when moving to smaller tube heat exchangers. Uh, luckily, a good heat exchanger design software tool, such as Coil Designer, can help you keep all this straight and uh, help you optimize your heat exchanger design. So with that, I have to do just a brief plug for Coil Designer, which is highly customizable design simulation and optimization tool for a variety of uh, types of heat exchangers, including tube fin, but not limited to tube fin. Um, Coil Designer is produced by OTS, and I, I really highly encourage you to take a look at webinar three, which has a lot of information about the capabilities of Coil Designer. Uh, one update since webinar three is the addition of a whole range of correlations for tubes which are less than five millimeters. So if that's something that you're looking to do. The software is ready to help you design that small diameter tube fin heat exchanger that I'm sure you've, you've been dreaming about. All right, now let's take a look at some case studies of three and five millimeter heat exchangers. All right, so let's take a look at two case studies. The first will be a water heater study in which the client wanted to replace a 516 inch tube evaporator, uh, 
five sixteenths is about eight millimeters. A tube evaporator for a residential heat pump water heater uh, with something in the five millimeter tube range. Uh, case number two is uh, was for an HVAC OEM that wanted to replace a microchannel condenser with something in the three to five millimeter tube range. The reason I picked these two particular case studies is that the first case is a sort of bread and butter example in which we go from a well-established state-of-the-art heat exchanger design and want to, for some reason or another, um, go to a smaller diameter tube. Um, you know, maybe it's increased capacity that's desired or a reduction in size or cost, some reason like that. Uh, case two is uh, a less common example um, where the client actually wanted to go from a microchannel heat exchanger to something in the three to five millimeter range. Uh, I wanted to highlight that an optimized tube fin design can, uh, you know, in certain cases, be competitive or, in fact, sometimes even uh, dominate uh, microchannel heat exchanger design. Okay, case one, uh, the heat pump water heater study. The goal of this study was to increase evaporator capacity of a residential heat pump water heater. The evaporator size was limited by the size of the enclosure, so the client did not want to redesign the equipment in any way and wanted it to be as close to a drop-in replacement as was possible. The original coil had 5 sixteenths or about eight millimeter copper tubing and aluminum louvered fins. The optimization goal was to maximize the heat load capacity while minimizing fan power. These parameters were put into the coil designer software along with a host of other uh, design constraints as was specified by the client and uh, appropriate correlations were applied. And uh, shown here is the Pareto comparison for this particular design study. This is a fairly typical output of what you might see for whatever your design parameters are. So in the case of this study, you're looking at heat load on the x-axis and fan pumping power here on the y-axis. So keep in mind these are normalized values, uh, normalized to the baseline. So the baseline design sits here at 1-1. One, one. Uh, everything in this curve made by these circles, that's this first curve here made by these circles, uh, represents the capacity of that same baseline heat exchanger as you increase the fan pumping power. Each of these other squares represents a unique output by coil designer. Uh, three of the designs, uh, that's design one, design two, and design three, um, as shown with these stars, were selected for additional analysis. Main difference in each of these curves, so note that there's sort of like three main curves here, one, two, three, uh, the main difference in these curves is that curve two had two rows of tubes, uh, which was the same as the baseline design. Uh, this second curve had three rows of tubes or one additional bank. And then this last one had uh, four rows or two additional banks. Design one was actually selected uh, by the client because it had the highest heat load while still maintaining the fan pumping power of the baseline design. So if you go to that number one on the normalized fan pumping power and follow it as far as you can to the right, that's where you end up at design one on that particular Pareto front. Design two, as you'll notice, has twice the fan pumping power. And then uh, design three has four times uh, the fan pumping power as the baseline design. As a result of this particular study, the client decided to build and test design one. Uh, but before we move on uh, to the results page, I wanted to draw your attention to uh, what we're calling design zero right here with, with this gold cross. Um, that particular design was not of interest necessarily to the client based on the goals of this project. Uh, but when Yoram goes on to discuss his cost model, that's the design that he'll be looking at uh, for the heat pump water heater example. 
the reason that design was selected for the cost model was uh, closer to an apples to apples comparison for that cost model. Um, remember this this design one had uh, an additional bank of tubes, so it makes it less of an apples to apples comparison. So look out for that when Yoram uh, presents his his findings later on. All right, so here's a table with a quantifiable comparison of the designs that we just saw on that previous slide. Um, so here's designs one, two, and three, and various parameters and how they compare to that baseline design. Um, primarily draw your attention to this design one has increased heat load, 32% more heat load capacity than the baseline design, uh, which was one of the main goals of that study. And then it has the same fan pumping power, which was the other goal of that study. And then uh, here's also design zero. So it has slightly higher capacity, 16% higher capacity, and again, the same fan pumping power. So design zero will be a cost model later on. Okay, let's move on to the second case study. The goal of this project was to replace a microchannel heat exchanger for a, a heat pump condenser with a tube fin design somewhere in the three to five millimeter tube range. The reason the client wanted to do this was the microchannel heat exchanger was actually purchased from a third party supplier and the OEM wanted to bring that production back in house since they already had the capability to produce tube fin heat exchangers in house, uh, but they did not have the microchannel capacity in house. They wanted to see if something that they could build in-house could be reasonably competitive with a microchannel heat exchanger. And this particular study was actually for two separate systems. Um, one was a two-ton uh, residential system, and the other was a 10-ton commercial system. So again, uh, similar to the, the previous case study, constraints were that it had to be a drop-in replacement. So height, width, and depth all had to be within a certain envelope. Fin density had to be within a certain range. Refrigerant pressure drop and refrigerant charge all had to be such that it could be a drop-in replacement. And again, the optimization goal here is to maximize heat load and minimize airside pressure drop. So here's the Pareto comparison for that OEM heat exchanger design, similar to what we saw before for the other study. We have the baseline design, Again, so these are normalized values. So the baseline design is uh, this star right here sitting at 1, 1. And remember, that's the microchannel heat exchanger design. And this particular study was done in uh, two parts. The first part of the study looked at how much capacity could be achieved with off-the-shelf fin designs. And that's these two groups down here um, circled with these green ovals. Uh, so the group, uh, this group right here is for the wavy off-the-shelf fin design, and this other bunch down here is the louvered off-the-shelf fin designs. You can see that the range of the normalized heat load is actually quite small. Um, so, so really anything that you see on, on this chart uh, represents uh, something that's competitive with the baseline or pretty close to the baseline in terms of, of heat load. Um, you can see for these uh, off-the-shelf fin designs, there's a bit of a penalty on the airside pressure drop. Um, but you know, depending on what the OEM is actually trying to achieve or what's important to them, um, this might be good enough uh, for what they're looking for. So that was the first part of the study. Uh, the second part of the study was to um, optimize the capacity of a tube fin design in that three to five millimeter range. And uh, for this portion, uh, we were able to optimize the fin design as well as uh, the tube configuration. So every other dot that you see here uh, that's not in one of these circles um, actually represents an optimized tube and fin design. So the optimized fins are still manufacturable as per the OEMs uh, manufacturing capabilities. That was based on thin manufacturing parameters that were provided to us by the OEM. 
And then again, anything in this, this green box right here dominates the baseline um, in, in terms of both heat load and airside pressure drop. So the main takeaway here um, is that an optimized tube fin heat exchanger can in fact compete with, uh, with a microchannel heat exchanger. Uh, before I move on, um, you'll notice that same gold cross right here. And uh, again, that'll be in Yorm's cost model. So when Yorm presents his cost model for this commercial heat exchanger, um, this is the heat exchanger that he's actually looking at. Here's the output for that two-ton residential system, uh, very similar to what you saw before for the commercial setup. I won't discuss it too much, but the main takeaway here is that, you know, also with a smaller two-ton system, um, there are designs with off-the-shelf fin designs that are competitive with the microchannel heat exchanger, and there are designs that, uh, when you optimize the fin design, can actually dominate that microchannel heat exchanger baseline represented with that star. Okay, now I'm gonna hand it over to Yoram for the cost model. Hello everyone. My name is Yoram Shabtai and I am head of the consulting firm Heat Transfer Technologies. We specialize in the development of novel heat exchanger design, fabrication and manufacturing processes. I myself have over 25 years experience in development, design, and fabrication of various types of heat exchangers in copper and in aluminum. Heat transfer technologies helped the International Copper Association develop the microgroove 5 mm copper tube heat exchanger technology years ago. We have used our experience to develop this cost model covering round tube plate fin heat exchanger and aluminum microchannel heat exchanger. Cost comparison of two real life case studies will be reviewed next. This slide covers the heat exchanger cost contributors. The main cost contributors are the materials shown on tops here. Nitrogen and furnace in the case of aluminum heat exchanger labor and equipment capital expenditure, which you will see in the next slides. The main cost contributors for each heat exchanger are highlighted in blue, as can be seen here in this section, and here for the comparison heat exchanger. We'll review the main cost contributors next. The materials cost breakdown is based on two inputs. One, the LME cost from December 2020, shown here, plus 30% FAB, shown here, and purchase cost of aluminum microchannel tube from suppliers, which is shown here in this section. In the cost comparisons, the materials cost are for an annual production rate of 500,000 units. The LME cost price in December 2020 was $796 a kilo or $362 per pound for the copper. The LME aluminum price was $2.05 a kilo or 93 cents a pound. Adding 30% fab, which is common, provides the copper tube and aluminum fin cost of $10.35 a kilo, which translates to $4.68 a pound copper tube, and $2.46 a kilo, or $1.18 a pound aluminum fin. Braze rings are 28 0.028 dollars each for copper and 0.01 for aluminum in high volume. Aluminum microchannel from Trumony Aluminum Limited or from Peerless America is $4.24 per kilo 
or $1.98 per pound, and the aluminum round clad tube that is used for manifold is $4.44 per kilo or $2.01 per pound. For aluminum microchannel tube heat exchanger brazing, an inert atmosphere brazing furnace is required. For half a million units annually, a continuous belt furnace is desirable. The nitrogen consumption of such a furnace is in the order of 2,500 standard cubic feet per hour, which means 21 cents per heat exchanger. If natural gas is used as energy source for heating, the cost is calculated to be 25 cents per heat exchanger. Equipment capex is shown for round tube plate fin and for aluminum microchannel heat exchangers. For round tube plate fin, the main equipment in millions is hairpin bender, fin press, fin die, tube expander, tube and fin assembly, and return band brazing equipment. The equipment totals 1.55 millions and dividing by 500,000 units results in 31 cents per heat exchanger. For aluminum microchannel heat exchangers, the main equipment consists of a manifold press, fin machine, fin die, tube and fin assembly equipment, and a continuous brazing furnace. The aluminum microchannel heat exchanger equipment totals 2.55 million. Divided by 500,000 units results in 51 cents per heat exchanger. The calculations consider a 10-year depreciation on capital expenditure. Case study cost comparison. A 516 tube 2 times 13 round tube plate fin evaporator versus 5 mm tube 2 times 18 evaporator heat exchanger. The side plate or bracket, the fin and the tube mass are taken from OTS data. The 516 OD tube heat exchanger has 0.09 kg sides, 0.67 kg fin, and 0.55 kg tube mass. Main contributors are the copper tube with $5.73, the fin cost is $1.64, and the braze rings are 73 cents. Labor described in this column is for one operator per machine or operation using standard hourly rate. The total for the 516 inch round tube plate fin evaporator heat exchanger is $12.60. The 5 mm tube has 0 0.09 kg sides, 0 0.74 kg fins, and 0.45 kg tube mass. The main cost contributors are the copper tube with $4.67, the fins with $1.83, and the braze rings with $1.01. The total for the 5 mm tube heat exchanger is $11.91. The second case study compares a commercial 59 tube aluminum microchannel condenser with a 136 3 mm copper tube heat exchanger. The fin and tube mass are taken from OTS data. The manifold tube mass is calculated according to the tube diameter and wall thickness appropriate for the 32 mm wide aluminum microchannel tube size. The manifolds are 1.06 kg, the fins are 8.54 kg and the 32 mm aluminum microchannel tubes 
or 8.5 kilograms. The main cost contributors are the aluminum microchannel tube with $36.06, the fins with $21, and the manifolds with $4.69. Aluminum brazing requires additional steps, namely degreasing, fluxing, drying, before brazing in a cab furnace. Core fluxing, drying and brazing are usually performed on the same furnace belt as a continuous process, requiring minimal supervision. Labor varies per operation as shown. The total for the aluminum microchannel heat exchanger is $78.60. The 3 mm tube heat exchanger has 0.56 kg size, 5.9 kg fins, and 2.8 kg tube mass. The main cost contributors are the copper tubes with $21.02, the fins with $14.50, and braze rings with $3.81. The total for the 5 mm tube heat exchanger is $58.13. This concludes the cost analysis and comparison section. Thank you. Thank you, Tiorm, for that detailed cost model. Just to synthesize, some of those numbers for case one, uh, which was the heat pump water heater evaporator. There's a 6% cost savings. And remember that that particular design actually had 16% higher heat load capacity than the baseline design. So although we tried to pick the closest apples to apples comparison to the baseline, um, you know, it's important to keep in mind that that uh, particular design was optimized for heat load and airside pressure drop. So if instead uh, we were optimizing directly for cost uh, while keeping you know, heat load, pressure drop, uh, envelope, things like that the same, then there's more than likely some additional cost savings to be had there. Similarly, for case study two, the heat load capacity, um, if you remember, that's for the microchannel heat exchanger uh, being replaced by a tube fin design, so the heat load uh, capacity there was nearly identical to the microchannel heat exchanger. Um, and even with that, there's a 35% cost savings when switching to that uh, three millimeter tube fin design. So again, if we were to optimize instead for cost savings, uh, it's quite possible that there would be additional uh, cost reduction uh, to be found there as well. Okay, thank you very much, Yoram. Uh, before wrapping it up, I'd like to tease the next two webinars that will be coming out a little later this year. Webinar five will take a look at heat exchanger design for use with alternative refrigerants. There are many al alternative refrigerants currently under consideration coming online um, for regulatory and environmental reasons, and we'll discuss how heat exchanger design needs to change when designing for some of these new refrigerants. And webinar six will take a look at the impact of frost on smaller diameter tubes uh, and also with uh, tighter fin densities. So we'll look at the possible performance degradation from water bridging between those tightly packed tubes and fins, um, as well as frost that might develop and uh, explore some possible mitigations. And that's it. Uh, so thanks for joining us, and don't forget to submit questions to myself or Yoram, and be sure to tune in uh, for the live session in a few weeks.